Hi everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Peloton Cycle, streaming lifespan classes to thousands with Logly and AWS. When you join today's webinar, you select a join, either by phone call or your computer audio. If for any reason you would like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in your control panel. Also, from this control panel, you will have the opportunity to submit questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the question pane. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. If for any reason we could not get to your question, we plan on responding to each of you personally through email. The deck will be available through SlideShare along with a recording of the webinar two to three days after the conclusion of this presentation. So keep an eye out for that email. My name is Juan Villa. I'm a solutions architect on the AWS partner team and I will be your speaker and moderator for today's webinar. So again, my name is Juan Villa, and we'll also be joined uh, later by Manoj uh, and Brian, who will also be presenting at today's webinar. Let's start with talking about DevOps and the AWS Cloud. So let's talk about the traditional development models and why they are obsolete, and what are good DevOps practices. Um, so businesses are increasingly software-driven today. Um, it's how we're innovating, and the end user expects both continuous improvement and stability from the applications that they consume every day. Uh, IT needs to be able to provision infrastructure very rapidly um, and with a lot of flexibility as the developers demand it, as, as the developers innovate. An organization's pace of innovation is largely constrained by their ability to develop applications. So let's take a look at uh, what DevOps looks like at a glance uh, by taking a look at what we call the delivery pipeline and the feedback loop. Um, so most people think that uh, DevOps and automation um, means having a CI, CD, or continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline in place. But there's more to DevOps practices than that. A, a lot of people forget uh, or, or overlook the feedback loop. Um, and this is arguably the, mo the most important part of your DevOps practice. Uh, the feedback loop is what tells you uh, and what tells your operations and development teams what's going on in production, what your users are experiencing and seeing every day. This feedback loop contains metrics, log data, and general health information regarding the production application. Um, and ultimately, this is the data that will give your organization the visibility they need and your development team the visibility they need uh, to make strategic and innovative decisions on what to change and what to improve and how to take the business to the next step. So let's talk about how these DevOps practices can really help. Let's highlight some of the benefits um, of, uh, of, of really good DevOps practices. Um, so with, uh, with effective DevOps practices, your business will benefit from increased agility. Your application will increase instability. Um, with proper feedback loops in place, you'll be able to meet your customer demands uh, more accurately and more rapidly. Um, you'll be able to um, spend more time innovating rather than maintaining uh, or doing the housekeeping uh, uh, things of development and operations. Um, and you'll be able to increase the overall security of your application as well. Um, and, and, and some other benefits as well will be uh, the, the ability to decrease the, the length of your development cycles by more accurately and precisely working on the things that uh, are innovative and will really take your business to the next step. Um, you'll also be able to decrease the time to market um, for the development of new features, for example, um, you'll be able to uh, decrease uh, the amount of, deploy of deployment failures and rollbacks, uh, which are generally the result of poor visibility, um, which the feedback loop, as I mentioned earlier, really does address. Um, you'll be able to decrease your time to recover upon failure um, and also decrease your operational overhead of managing your, your, uh, your application infrastructure. So what about DevOps practices on AWS specifically? So AWS provides on-demand infrastructure resources and tooling uh, that's built to enable common DevOps practices. Um, for example, when we take a look at infrastructure as, a co uh, as code, we have some services like CloudFormation um, and OpsWorks uh, that allows you to specify your infrastructure in a, in a repeatable fashion in the form of code that you can check into, for example, source control. Um, we also have microservices-oriented uh, uh, services and features, such as our, our EC2 container service, or ECS for short. 
Um, we also have uh, CI/CD services, so continuous integration and continuous deployment services, such as Code Pipeline, Code Deploy, and the recently announced uh, Code Star that we actually announced yesterday at the San Francisco Summit. Um, we also have some logging and monitoring services, such as CloudWatch and CloudWatch Logs. So let's talk real quick about infrastructure as code. Um, so with infrastructure as code, you can replace the traditional uh, infrastructure provisioning and management with code-based techniques, um, which means that you can very accurately repeat and redeploy uh, your infrastructure anywhere, whether it's in you know, the East Coast, the West Coast, or halfway across the world. Um, you'll be able to uh, build these custom templates and provision resources in a controlled and predictable way. And you can use version control to keep track uh, of all the changes that you've made. Microservices is becoming very u u ubiquitous, um, so we're seeing it pretty much everywhere now. And this is uh, it's it's uh, helping to create some proper isolations and separations of concerns in your deployments and your applications. Um, it allows you to scale up and scale down components as required with very little notice uh, when using proper mi microservices practices. Um, it also does make uh, the configuration. Uh, code change is repeatable um, and standardized. It allows you to scale independent components one from the other. Um, so it, it generally goes hand in hand with good DevOps practices when deploying applications. For continuous integration and continuous deployment, this is what most folks are familiar with when we talk about DevOps, right? So this is going to allow you to model and visualize your release flow, automate your deployment, um, increase your productivity. Um, you can find and address bugs quicker, run automated testing, and ultimately uh, keep a very agile deployment pipeline to release code as quickly and effective as possible to, you, to your customers. We also have logging and monitoring. So with logging and monitoring, you can capture, categorize, and analyze the data and logs generated by applications and infrastructures, which really gives you a lot of visibility and auditability of all the activities that are, that are taking place within your application. Um, it will also let you assess uh, how, how your application is performing in the given infrastructure. It will give you insights into potential root issues in, in your application. Um, and also enables you to create alerts based on thresholds that you define to, to support events, for example. So just at a glance, summaries of DevOps on, on AWS, you can automate systems operations, you can get started very quickly and pay as you go with most of our services. Um, you'll have improved visibility and security. You'll be able to leverage fully managed services, scale without infrastructure constraints, and take advantage of Amazon's global partner ecosystem, um, and take advantage of top top-notch partners such as Logly, uh, who has achieved the DevOps competency on top of AWS. So with that, I will transition uh, to Manoj uh, from Logly, who's the CTO and Vice President of Engineering. Manoj, the floor is yours. Thanks, Juan. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, before I start my presentation, I really like uh, to understand uh, the, the audience. So. It'll be, uh, I would like to do a quick poll. It is a two question poll, simple. If you uh, answer those questions, it will really help me uh, navigate through my presentation. So uh, uh, if you please specify your role, that will be really helpful. Next question, please. So this is, if you can help me understand what do you use for log management, and the options are whether you're using homegrown application, you're using on-premise, commercial log management, cloud-based, or you're not using any solution at all. So that, that will really helpful.
Okay, thank you very much uh, for um, giving the poll. It seems like fair number of people are still uh, are in the DevOps and fair number of audience are using log management. So I'll track accordingly. So what, what I'm going to talk today then behind is we'll talk about vision behind starting Logly, what drive us, and then talk about the Logly architecture, how it is built under the cover. Can you move next slide, please? Okay. So um, Logly was founded in 2009 in SFO. The vision behind the company was to commoditize the log management basically make it available for small to medium businesses. And if you see in those days, in 2009, most of the log management solutions slash products were on-premises. On it required massive amount of cost in first buying the licenses and then hiring the people and consultants to implement it. And not only just implementation, on the continuous basis, you need administrators to manage it. So what we wanted to do was to take all that work off our customers and offer the solution for log management in the cloud. So no work needs to be done <clears throat> on the customer end. And we don't have any footprint on your premises. So you don't have to worry about managing and mon monitoring anything for the log management. So we started with that vision. Now we have 10,000 customers who are using us for their log management services and we are the advanced technology partner for AWS. So if you see, we, as I said, we started for targeting commoditizing log management, targeting small to medium business, but since then we have expanded into much larger enterprises along with SMB. So if you look at some of our customers like Dell, Logitech, Rumble, they are a big enterprises and we are in many verticals, gaming, hardware, uh, music, all the industries which span across the broad spectrum uh, is using. So we are becoming a trusted platform for our customer. So what drives us um, is if you have a technology and if you have a log, Logly will be able to ingest that log and will help you provide analysis and real-time debugging of your technology stack. And we are deployment agnostic, so it doesn't matter whether you have microservices, whether you have cloud computing or your internet of thing, doesn't matter, all those generates log and Logly will be able to ingest we are completely agnostic of your vertical too, whether you are in gaming or you are any other industry, you can stream log to us and we will allow you to manage your uh, your deployments. So what, what's happening under the cover, right? It, as the more and more applications are moving to microservices architecture and distributed architecture, the application are inherently becoming complex and what we provide is not only a tool to just store your logs in the centralized log management, but we allow you to, we allow to get you the hidden stories inside your log so that you don't have to search them, find them, and then take an action. We reveal what is hidden under the log to have you take actions on them. So that's basic gist of what Logly does. At, very good than your competition, than our competition. Okay, so let's look under the cover how the architecture is. If you look at a very high level, any log management is four step. We ingest the log, we process them, and then we index them. Once the logs are indexed, we allow our customers to search and to analytics on top of it. It's as simple as that. It can't get any simple than this one. But when you look under the cover, it becomes much 
much more complex. Sorry, I'm waiting for, yeah, okay. So let's look under the cover uh, for the architecture. So those three boxes which I just showed you, where it is, it said ingest. I expanded that box to ingestion pod. The second step in previous slide where it said, said process, I created a processing pod and for index, I created an indexing pod. And under that, I have shown how the architecture for Logly is built. So let, there are a few ways you can send logs to Logly. So let's assume you have your server sitting in your premise and you want to send log to Logly. All you need to do is, is configure syslog. We use out of the box standard protocol to send logs to Logly. We don't need, you don't need to install any agent on any of your server. We use native capabilities of your operating system to send logs to us. Syslogs are getting distributed with with OSs from many, many years. So if you're running Unix, we allow you to send through syslog. If you're using Windows, we allow you to send through NX log. So once, and you point all those logs to logs-01, logly.com, it comes to us. The first point it hit is the collector box, which you see under ingestion pod. The, this service is built with one mission in life which is to work at network speed. Doesn't matter at what speed our customer throws log at it, it is able to accept and ingest them. These collectors are distributed across the regions in AWS, both AWS West and East, and within region, they are spread across the zone. So if one zone goes down, other zones take over. If whole region goes down, the other region takeovers. Completely fault tolerant mechanism it built. Once collector accepts the events, it immediately puts it into Kafka. We call it checkpoint. At this point, the logs got stored into the logly. The other way you can send log to us is if you have logs sitting in Amazon S3 or CloudTrail, you just have to provide us the S3 bucket name and we will ingest logs from there. This is shown on the blue box, uh, top two um, boxes. And then once logs is in Kafka broker, we also allow you to archive. The way log management service get bought is you tell how much volume you want to send per day and how long you want to retain in Logly. Beyond that, if for your auditing purposes or archival purposes, you want to store those logs for years, it is much more cost effective to store in S3. So we ask for that uh, S3, it's completely option, optional, and then all the logs go to the Amazon S3. So at this point, everything is ingested. And from here, the processing of your logs take over. It's not step by step. Everything in the cloud is happening parallelly. Just for explanation purpose, I'm going step by step. The processing part, the first thing we do is we the mapping and parsing, it picks the log from Kafka broker and here all the magic happens. We detect what kind of log it is. Is it a Java log? Is it an Nginx? Is it Hadoop? Is it Cassandra? And we take that log and convert into, into a structured log. You as a customer don't have to do anything. You have just pointed your log. Once that is converted into structured, we stored it again in Kafka. At this point, the reason to store in Kafka is any all our services, microservices are stateless. Any services can go and come, nothing get lost. And once the data is converted into structured, the indexers on the yellow box in indexing pod picks that data and store it into our search engine in analytics and search engine. Now here, a lot of work needs to be done because this is a time series data. Customer can send data from the past and customers can log, send log, which is in real time. Most of the time logs are in real time, but at times, it is from the past. So indexer has to detect which index 
it has the the event belongs to so we do lot of index management so before i go to index management real quick at this point the log got collected it got analyzed converted into structure indexer took it and stored it in the search engine now how the index management happen every time we we do index management on two bases size and time and from there indexer picks which index the data needs to go in and all that is managed in Amazon MySQL, which is a metadata and policy for index management. And on top of it, we offer our customers the services which they access through our web browser to search and do analysis. So if you see, you have ingested the log, it got automatically converted for you into the structured data. It is in search engine and through our front end, you can analyze and um, do searches and alerting. So that that under the cover gives you the visibility into Logly. Now I will hand over to Brian, who is our Logly customer, and he because now you've seen how it works. He will walk you through how he, as a Logly user, uses at Palatin. Thanks, Manoj. Uh, my name is Brian Tinsley. I am the manager of the site reliability engineering team at Peloton. Uh, our team focus is a little bit different than what you might expect uh, hearing the words SRE if you know Google's uh, definition of SRE, but very much inspired um, by it. So uh, our team focus is to give our engineering teams um, everything that they need from uh, tooling and um, monitoring and, and just knowledge about how it is that they can run their applications in production. Um, so let me tell you, I guess, a little bit about Peloton, what we do, um, and sort of what our, our scaling and uh, growth challenges are. Um, so Peloton is a at-home fitness company. Um, our primary product that you very likely have seen commercials on television for is an at-home spin bike. Um, that spin bike uh, is completely manufactured by us, including a custom uh, Android tablet that uh, we stream uh, generally about 10 classes a day on. Um, over the past uh, two years, and actually a little more than two years, we have uh, streamed 3,000 hours of live video. Uh, we have 4,000 classes available. Um, last year, here's just some summary statistics. We had um, uh, our riders spent a collective 219 years on their bikes. They uh, rode 31 million miles and burned uh, 1.4 billion calories. Um, so let me tell you, uh, I think a little bit about, I'm not going to spend much time on uh, video streaming, but um, I will tell you a, a little bit about some of our challenges that we've faced. So um, we have a, a lot of data that's coming in, and we process that data very similar to Logly, we process that data in real time. So every second while you're taking a spin class, you might be competing against up to 2,000 other people, for example. Uh, every second we're taking in a data point. We're computing where you rank uh, from that data point with everybody else in the same second and returning um, back to you your personal ranking. And that's displayed in real time throughout a ride. So for a 45 minute ride, that's 2,700 data points um, times 2,000 riders, and that goes on all day, every day. We also have on-demand classes where we recreate that experience by replaying the leaderboard uh, and inserting you where you would have been had you taken that class with the people that have taken it before, including previous uh, on-demand riders. Um, uh, as you would guess, that multiplies out to currently somewhere around 17 billion API calls a day, uh, and we are um, I, I didn't bother to put a, a graph in here because we have a proverbial hockey stick, but our, our hockey stick um, is, is sort of interesting. We had, you know, a, a, maybe a toddler hockey stick uh, two years ago. This past year we had a, 
uh, you know, slightly larger hockey stick. And then uh, our projections have us uh, with probably this year having yet another hockey stick since we have a, a very seasonal growth pattern. Um, we tend to grow a lot in the winter when people are indoors exercising. Um, so we probably will see a, a, a very, very large uptick. Um, and we have more and more scaling challenges to deal with every day as our user base has grown um, 5x year over year for uh, at least the past two years. Um, moving on, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the data flows and how we use Amazon um, uh, to, uh, to provide basically all the services that that we have. So uh, on the far left, you'll see our three primary client applications. So we have our uh, bikes that our users take their spin classes on. That's probably the primary driver behind most of the data flow. Um, definitely is. The website, our e-commerce website and brochure and has class scheduling. It's a place where you can go and look at your statistics uh, about your historical rides. You can follow people, um, you know, sort of a social platform as well. Um, that's one of the consumers of our APIs. Um, and then you have our iOS application, which uh, allows users, uh, users with home bikes can uh, use this content for free, or you can subscribe and just take our classes on the bike at your gym or the bike in your building, or if you have another uh, type of stationary bike or, or you know, preferably a spin bike, um, you, can, uh, you can use that and use our content as well. Uh, that all hits our API. That's in the second section is uh, an application load balancer. Um, we use uh, HTTP URL pattern based routing uh, for our service oriented architecture. Um, the next thing you'll see is two auto scaling groups. There's actually a lot more than that, but um, just to give you sort of an idea, you've got two auto scaling groups on the back end. The data storage lives in three layers that you probably are familiar with and one that is proprietarily ours. So um, at the top you see the RDS icon. We use Postgres um, to store most of our user data, our schedule data, that type of thing. Um, then we have uh, ElastiCache, uh, Memcache D um, is uh, very heavily used for, for caching lots of different types of data in our system. Um, Redis is our primary data store uh, for large, large volumes of data that we want to persist for a long time, and um, we know by key how to retrieve that data. And the leaderboard is actually a custom database or a custom uh, storage engine um, that provides the functionality that we talked about earlier. We'll ingest thousands of data points a second and provide back sorted versions of those data points with uh, additional metadata tagged onto them. Um, that then feeds into the next level, which is uh, our logging. So actually everything above um, or every, everything to the left of the uh, this sort of central section that has there's an auto scaling group and uh, SQS and another auto scaling group. Um, those are um, that's sort of our internal logging pipeline. Um, so the the first thing is just a log aggregation and filtering point. So um, here, if we decide that something's generating too much input level logging and we want to filter it, we can do it here um, before it passes on to the rest of our infrastructure um, for logs that need normalization. They maybe have customer data in them or something along those lines. Um, those messages get put into SQS and then they get pulled off by workers in, a, in the bottom group, which actually does um, sort of sanitization and normalization. So we have in our URL patterns, um, we have a lot of UUIDs. Um, those get stripped out and converted into a standard character so that when they show up in um, uh, not in Logly, but actually in Datadog, they aggregate around the same time series. Um, we do lots of that type of, of transformation, and sometimes we actually duplicate the, the log entry so that we have the raw version and we have the normalized version as well. Um, that feeds into three places. 
the logging goes to um, to Datadog where we can do alerting and aggregation and see sort of real-time trending around various types of logs. Some functionality overlap with Logly, but I'll get into in a minute how Logly is very, very different. Um, and then Redshift uh, consumes a lot of our API traffic logs, um, and we use that for analysis. Our business intelligence team actually uses our um, HTTP access logs um, for business intelligence purposes. And so that data gets delivered to Redshift, so that's all in one place. Um, if you move on, uh, Logly and Datadog both will uh, give us more visibility and allow us to see those logs in real time. Sometimes when something happens and um, it warrants immediate action by either an engineer or um, uh, somebody else in the organization, uh, it'll post a message to Slack, or um, it'll open an incident in PagerDuty. And you also have the ability to um, watch your logs live, aggregated across your entire network, filtered by a regular expression. So if you're looking for a very specific thing and you want to see it in real time, you can pop open the Logly Logtail uh, job application. Uh, it's terribly easy to use. You just download it and, and start it up with the pattern that you want. You drop in your uh, API keys and, and off you go, filtering and watching logs in real time. And it'll even highlight the, the strings that you're looking for. Um, so I'm going to go through a little bit of our use cases for Logly and, and how we go. But first, I wanted to talk a bit about why we decided to go with AWS. So um, a little bit of background about Peloton. We started with a Kickstarter campaign in 2013, uh, sort of a, a proof of uh, market viability. Um, that campaign went really well and immediately uh, sent us off to scramble to get the first version of the bike and the software and leaderboard and all of those different things together. Uh, there were no resources, there were no people, there was no time to build out a data center. Um, and, and in 2013, there was really no need to build a data center. Resources were sort of pay-as-you-go um, available in the cloud, and it, it was sort of a no-brainer. And uh, when I talk a little bit in a while about choosing Logly, it's sort of a no-brainer for us at the stage of the business that we were at, and, and it continues actually to be the right thing for us as uh, we have no idea what the upper bound um, of our uh, business uh, growth will look like. And, uh, and so, you know, we don't spend an inordinate amount of time forecasting for what kind of compute resources are we going to need. We just have to focus on will our platform actually scale to handle the traffic that we're building. AWS will turn on as many machines as we need. Um, it's just a matter for us of making sure that our software is designed so that it does scale horizontally and will scale um, as long as, uh, as we grow. Um, so. I spoke to this a little bit earlier, but our uh, team mission is to provide the knowledge, uh, tooling, insight that helps engineers run their applications easily and reliably. Um, and one of the things that we try to focus on is observability and, and helping engineers understand what observability means. So that might be emitting data points to StatsD, that might be adding additional logging. Uh, an example of one of the things that uh, we log is every um, third-party API call. We log both the request and the response that we get back from the partner because if there's any breakdown in communication there, the first thing that we're going to need if we don't think their API is responding properly or we think maybe our code's wrong, the first thing we're going to need is to see the payload that's going back and forth between between the two um, APIs. Um, so that type of thing, just being uh, almost overly verbose with logging. We can always filter it if it d becomes too noisy uh, or we can turn it off. But, you know, I, I think our default uh, um, is to log everything. And it's uh, it served us really well. Um, so some of the things that uh, um, we've gotten, some of the things that we've seen out of making our application more observable um, is uh, better customer experience. And what I mean by that is we've actually 
um, started working on client-facing metrics around user experience. So I'll give you a very concrete example. The leaderboard that we were talking about being real-time, um, we had some issues for a while where it wasn't functioning exactly in real-time. Uh, people were experiencing some delays, and most people wouldn't notice a two-second delay or a three-second delay because we're sending the data back and forth in joules, but what you actually see is kilojoules. So most people weren't noticing the delay, but sometimes the delay would get really, really long, and you might notice if 10 seconds passes and you've ticked up a number in kilojoules and it doesn't show up on the leaderboard. So we actually started uh, timing how long it takes you, your output to show up on the leaderboard. So if I pass the, uh, a particular kilojoule marker right now, or actually a particular joule marker right now, when does that n amount of joules show up on the leaderboard? And then that number gets reported back on a regular basis and gets recorded. We use the, the trending of that data um, to help us understand whether or not the real-time leaderboard is actually functioning in a real-time way. Um, and then we look into software metrics and, and uh, build tooling inside the, the application itself to help us understand, well, how can we correlate bad user experience with what's going on inside of our software? Logging is extensively used in, in that process, not only um, for understanding the software, but for making sure that the metrics that we're getting from the clients make sense. Um, so I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit as well. Faster innovation is uh, pretty easy to see how that works. I mean, the more you log, the easier it is for you to push code out with the knowledge that you'll have some ability to troubleshoot and debug when it gets out there. And a shorter mean time to recovery is uh, obviously um, also pretty uh, pretty key. So I think I already spoke to our idea about logging everything, uh, reality checking metrics. Um, uh, Spawning outliers is, is something that's uh, really, really useful, um, and uh, I don't really have time to go into it a little bit, and Manoj didn't speak to it, but um, they actually support anomaly detection in their logging system, and it's, uh, it's really, really powerful. It's, uh, you know, almost all of the monitoring platforms out there are um, starting to, to look towards finding anomaly detection, so I, I would encourage you guys, uh, um, if you look at uh, some of the features in, that Logly offers. Uh, one of the one of the more interesting ones is uh, their ability to do anomaly detection. Another one is uh, derived uh, drive values, which I, I'm not going to have time to touch on as well. Um, one of the, the keys to our ability to trace things through our system is the fact that pretty much every request is traveling with a UID. Um, so I think that's that's actually been really really valuable for us. Um, so it may be somebody's hitting 15 different API endpoints and there's things happening downstream, that UUID is going to show up in the logs of pretty much all of those events. And so if we know that, we can actually go through, this is especially helpful for historically figuring out what went on for a particular user on a particular day. We just grab that UUID from that event from maybe their ride that day and go through our, our log history and, and actually sort of see, oh, I see exactly here there was a break where they weren't making requests for you know, 30 seconds and that caused a 30 second delay. I, I totally see exactly why that happened. Now, we may not be able to answer why their Wi-Fi wasn't working well or if that was in fact the, the issue. So um, let me back up just a second. Um, so w one of our really, really important use cases is the ability to go in and figure out um, when, when we see error rates, increased error rates on a particular API endpoint, for example. Um, is this a systemic issue? In other words, is our, our payment processor down or is our shipping processor or sales tax calculator, whatever, right? Is, is one of our partners down? Is our database having problems? Or is it just the same person putting in their credit card information wrong? And so you'll see uh, above um, an alert that fired from Datadog, actually, um, that said, hey, you had more than 10 um, 400 errors. And uh, pretty much 400s are usually bad credit card numbers, something along those lines. Um, you have more than 10 in the last five minutes. Well, if you actually go to the dashboard, uh, um, you can look and you can see this is actually 30 minutes. What were our card processing errors look like? And this is a lot, this is a, a screenshot directly out of one of our real Logly dashboards. Um, and so you might not be able to read it, but it says the transaction has been declined. That was the lion's share of them. There were 19. Um, 
please, please provide a valid zip code. There were 14 of those failures, and then um, two people used expired cards in the last 30 minutes. And so that more than explains our uh, uh, threshold of 10 failures that got crossed. Um, another use case that's really sort of neat is Livetail allows you to take whatever you're seeing in Livetail and pipe it to uh, Slack or HipChat. Uh, you drop a Slack um, URL post, uh, and they will actually post it back to the HTTP endpoint in real time. Um, now, Slack is not a place for reading logs. Slack is a good place, though, if you have stuff that you really don't want to see or stuff that might help you correlate and understand events um, at a fairly reasonably low volume. Um, Slack's a really good place for that. And so we have this here is actually matching on error out of a particular cluster in our, um, so you can actually see the, the regular expression highlighted. I left that in there. Um, so the, the, the block area, or if you use Slack, it's, it's, it looks like it's in single backticks. Um, that's actually mat the regular expression match. So error messages coming from this particular cluster show up in Slack. Um, that's uh, really, really handy for quickly understanding if something's a one-off. Uh, we also fire alerts on uh, things that show up in Logly that we never ever want to see. Um, out of memory killer, uh, killing our applications is not something we want to see. We, for the most part, try to not have any swap space. So out of memory killer will do its job, but we try to proactively have our applications um, kill themselves and recover gracefully. Um, and, and not kill other things uh, on the system. Too many open files, that's another one that from time to time, something will hit an open file limit. We have a, a, a aggressively high uh, limit for open files, but sometimes when you're trying to process lots and lots of leaderboards for lots and lots of people simultaneously, for example, you may have you may hit too many open files. Um, and then like kernel errors, uh, anything that's in kernel log that you never want to see, file system errors, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and then we actually uh, look for things missing, for example. Uh, if we don't see any results uh, for a successful processing of a particular queue over a particular time window, we know that that queue is almost certainly not being worked because people are using our platform 24 hours a day. Uh, go through the last couple here. So, so one of the really, really nice things um, that Logly lets us do is, as I spoke to earlier, if you're logging lots and lots of things um, and you go into production and somebody identifies a bug uh, in production and it's reproducible, you can roll back. That's pretty easy, right? And then you go and you look in the logs and you see, hey, can I figure out exactly why this went sideways and why we didn't catch it. Uh, and maybe you add, if you can reproduce it, and maybe you add logging to help you understand more uh, about exactly what's going on uh, in your application so that um, if there's a recurrence of that bug or, or if it's, it's something that's hard to reproduce, maybe you just add logging to, to be able to understand what's going on. Um, so the reasons we chose Logly, uh, like I said, this was a no-brainer. Uh, we had all these logs coming out of syslog. Uh, we could just forward them straight to Logly. Uh, on day one, that was our only integration point. It's still uh, pretty much our, our uh, main delivery mechanism. Um, the feature set was, did it have all the things that we needed? Well, it had a superset, still has a superset of things that we need. We don't probably, uh, like a lot of tools, right, it does a lot more than what we actually take advantage of, and, and that was preparing for this webinar. I, I, I looked around at some of the things that Logly has to offer, and um, th their feature set's so much richer than, than even what we need, but they're continuing to add things that are that are highly useful and actually if you know I spent more time with Logly and we as a team spend more time with uh, a lot of our tools I think uh, we get more not only value out of them but they make our lives easier and then from a cost perspective I, I mean it was just a, a slam dunk no-brainer why would you even consider an enterprise logging solution that requires you to spin up your own hardware and manage it yourself and managed services for us are, are almost a mandate uh, if you look through, we don't manage any of those databases that you saw 
um, we try to manage as, as little as possible. Um, so this just sort of recaps the stuff that I've covered. I think I've run over a little bit on time, so I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, pass back to uh, Juan, and uh, he's going to start taking some questions. Yep, absolutely. Brian, thank you very much. Manoj, thank you as well for the very insightful presentations. Um, at this point, uh, we are in our Q&A portion of our webinar. Um, and I wanted to go ahead and remind uh, everyone that if you have any questions, uh, please submit your questions for the panelists uh, using the questions tab in your control panel. Um, and we will try to address as many of them in this uh, live Q&A portion. Um, so we've already received uh, a few questions. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, start with the first question here I've got, um, which is a request to uh, talk a bit more about monitoring best practices uh, for microservices. So I'm going to go ahead and take a stab at that from the Amazon Web Services perspective. Um, but, and then I'm going to pass it to Manoj from Logly to kind of uh, augment that with some lovely specific information. Um, so that's a very good question. And, uh, and the reason is because microservices uh, sort of has posed a, a challenge uh, in the world of logging and monitoring because we're now taking systems that used to be monolithic systems that used to log to a single file or, or a two files, you know, places that were very easy to find. Um, and we've kind of broken that up into uh, separate concerns and separate services that have specific functions and they run on, you know, clusters of different computers and they generate a lot of logging information in a lot of different places. And this is why today more than ever, uh, good DevOps practices and logging practices are so important. Um, and partners like Logly have uh, developed features and functionality that make it actually very easy uh, to install, uh, you know, the log collection agents and to follow best practices for collecting these logs from all the from all the different systems, right? So a good best practice for this would be absolutely collect all your logs and all your microservices. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, will use Docker for microservices, for example, um, and and go to container-based approach. Um, and with Docker, uh, you can use like logging agents uh, that you can actually uh, install uh, and configure, log to a file, for example, collect the logs uh, with log these agents, um, and you can uh, and you can push it to a central location, which is the most important thing: is to push all your logging data from all your systems, from all your different microservices, to a central location, so that you can analyze it with context, right? So. Uh, if there's any like key takeaway uh, for the best practices here, I would say that that is the key takeaway. So I'll go ahead and transition it now to Manoj so he can add a little bit of information on top of this. Absolutely, I think I think you covered really well. So I'll I'll first talk the biggest advantage, and then I'll talk about the uh, best practices on microservices. I said Logly had a big advantage over other log management products, especially for microservices and if you're using containers, that you you as our customers don't need to install any agent on it. It, it just use the native protocol, uh, which nat native demons which comes with your operating systems and, and just do Docker's capability to send logs. So you don't have to manage anything as you're services are coming up, it will automatically get configured and send logs to Logly. It's a huge advantage. The other thing I would say is in microservices, the biggest challenge is when messages are flowing from one service to another service, keeping track of the message is very, very important. So one practice I suggest is to have the same UUID or some kind of identifier which flows from one in the transaction remains same when it goes from one microservice to another microservices. So when you have a troubleshooting use case, you can track that transaction and figure it out which microservice it is giving problem at. And second thing I would suggest is when you send logs to systems like Logly, you should tag your, your logs and decorate it from which microservice it's coming in and provide the information so that troubleshooting becomes much easier and analysis become much easier. Perfect, thanks Manoj. So we have a second question here, um, which is how do you address security concerns over sharing lots into managed cloud solutions? 
because um, there may be sensitive information within the logs, um, and you probably don't want to retain those outside of a controlled network for maybe compliance reasons, for example, to mention one reason. Um, so I'm going to uh, hand this over to Manoj so he can talk about uh, the, the features and practices that they take for filtering out this sensitive information. Thanks, Brian. And great question. Uh, and this, this comes quite often uh, when I talk to customers or talk to our prospects. So uh, I think one basic gist before going in deeper into it is all the logs which is sent to us is on a secure protocol. Even within our microservices, the, uh, uh, the traffic flows on secure protocol. But the question is more around how to protect that data and how to filter it out. So uh, we use our syslog kind of uh, agents to uh, tools to send logs to Logly. And our syslog has built-in filtering capability to filter the log based on the name of the field. You can be as rich as putting a regular expression to filter out all sensitive in information in there before sending to Logly. So for some reason, if you can't send those log to us or certain fields, you can just filter it out at the level of our log before even it hit, goes out of your data center and servers. All right, perfect. Thanks again, Manoj. Um, all right, so we have uh, some questions here uh, for Brian uh, from Peloton. Um, so the first question here is, do you think it's possible to have too much log data? How do you deal with data coming from different levels of your system or different environments? Uh, that's a fantastic question, and it's a, uh, I think it's a quasi-religious debate, but I'll give you my take. Um, as long as your log logging answers questions, I don't think you can have too much. In other words, every single place in your code that you're inserting a log line, uh, ask the question to yourself, what question will this help me answer when I see it in whatever logging tool I'm looking in? Um, to me, if you can answer, provide a reasonable answer to that question, um, then it's absolutely invaluable to have that logging there. Um, is it possible to have too much? I'm sure it is. I, I can even say I've seen it, but um, for the most part, as, as long as you're not just logging like, hey, I got to line 72, hey, I got to line 74, like, um, you know, I think just uh, make sure that your, your logging is, is providing value. Um, and any logs that provide value, there's never ever going to be too much of them. Logs that don't provide value, I don't care how few of them they're generated, uh, you know, they're too much. So that's sort of the way I look at and, and think about that. But I, I don't think there's a quantitative answer to that. All right, excellent. Thanks, Brian. And we've got here a, a, a couple more for you. Um, so, so the first of these is, uh, did you consider uh, an open source log management system, um, and how did it compare to a solution like Log B solution? So I I can tell you that uh, you know historically I've worked with enterprise uh, on prem. Uh, I've worked with enterprise um, cloud uh, that was not Logly. I've worked with um, several uh, other solutions. Peloton specifically. It has a very strong bent on not managing uh, infrastructure that we can pay someone else to manage and do a better job at. So uh, I'll give you an example of that. We uh, use Redis as a primary backing store. Uh, we use Redis Labs for that. Um, they have a large portion of the Redis contributors uh, working in their shop. If we run into any problems with Redis, it's much, much more likely that they'll be able to solve those problems than we will. Um, and it's a critical part of our business operations. So we look at the professional services and uh, managed services spaces as crucial to augmenting our ability to deliver our product. What we don't want to do is spend time um, doing things that don't differentiate us and, and frankly rolling out a logging platform and managing it and scaling it, those are not things that help us sell more bikes, more shoes, more anything. Um, they don't make our customer experience any better. Uh, and so, no, we actually never ever 
contemplated it. All right. Thanks, Ryan. And one more question for you. Um, how does Peloton filter out logging that is too verbose? Um, in practice, we don't filter any logging. Um, when I say we don't filter any logging, what I mean by that is if somebody adds a new log line today uh, to an API, you know, maybe they add 10 log lines to a controller for an API endpoint that gets hit a couple million times a day. Um, we're actually just going to consider that a bug and let them fix it rather than add any kind of filtering um, from a uh, from a practical standpoint. From a technical standpoint, um, our filtering mechanisms are fairly sophisticated and easily modifiable, and we could match those lines and start filtering them out if we wanted to. If uh, doing a hot fix for what we consider a bug, bad logging <laughs> is a bug, um, uh, we, we would we would have the uh, potential to do that. But um, you know, we, we don't we don't really differentiate anything. We don't run any applications in debug or trace mode in production. Um, so we, we don't have much issue with that. As far as separating logs out by environment, um, we actually use the syslog. Um, so the query semantics in Logly are actually very, very rich. If you send uh, structured data in the form of JSON, um, you can actually query JSON by field. And then the built-in semantics for matching things like syslog hostname support regular expressions. And our host names actually follow a pattern that lets us match the environment uh, based on the, uh, the host name. So that should answer that question as well that I think I skipped earlier. All right, excellent. So I think we have time for one more question. So we've got another question here, um, and this one's directed to Manoj from Logly. Uh, the question is, I see that Logly auto-recognizes log formats, but does it also allow uh, the manual selection or specification of a log format in case the auto-correction is, or the auto-recognition is incorrect? Yeah, it's a great question again. Uh, Brian touched a little bit, and he didn't go into detail. We have something called derived fields. So if there are custom logs which we don't able to detect and convert from unstructured to structured data, you as a user of a log leak can create the rules to convert that into structured data. And that, that functionality is called derived rules. So you can go there and create your own rules on top of that unstructured data to how you want to structure it, and they will get structured as well. All right, excellent. Well, uh, we have a, a few more questions that we didn't get an opportunity uh, to get to in this live Q&A section of our webinar. Uh, we will be reviewing those questions and responding uh, to you guys via email. Um, but I just want to say uh, thanks to all of you for attending, and thank you very much for our panelists today for the presentations. Um, and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you.